Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Okay, greetings, everyone. I think we are, are going to try to start. My name is Lauren Leibarger, and I am one of this year's uh, Marty Center Fellows and have been asked by Professor Clark Gilpin to introduce this afternoon's uh, forum. Professor Gilpin, who is leading the Marty Center this year, along with Professor Doniger, uh, sends his sincerest apologies. He had fully intended to present today, or be present today, um, and, to, and to be and to present, actually. Um, But an unforeseen exigency arose, and he was unable to come. So it's my my distinct honor to welcome you this afternoon to the first of three Marty Center Fellows seminars or forums. Senior fellows in the Marty Center are scholars from the United States and from other countries on sabbatical leave from their home institution. At the Marty Center, they situate their research within a broader cultural frame of reference bringing their perspectives to bear on religious questions facing the wider public. This year, the Marty Center is hosting three senior fellows, Betty Beyer, who will be speaking to you uh, today about whom I will have more to say in a a few minutes, Um, Susan Shapiro, who unfortunately um, also was not able to be here today, uh, and myself. Now, if I might speak for all of us, I would like to say that we as senior fellows are immensely grateful to the Marty Center for the opportunity it has afforded us to interact with some of the most talented up and coming scholars in the field of religious studies in our weekly or bi-weekly seminars. Not to mention, of course, the scholars here uh, at the Divinity School and at the University of Chicago who are at the forefront of their various sub-disciplines. On behalf of all of us, I would like to say thank you uh, to all of you at the Center and at the Divinity School for this truly unique opportunity. Today's forum focuses on the book, When Prophecy Fails. Published in 1956, the book is considered a classic by many in the field of social psychology and arguably in religious studies and other fields as well. The book and its theory of cognitive dissonance have shaped debates in these and other fields and in the wider culture in ways that are often unacknowledged. But how do do the book and its theory speak to us today? How best to understand the long resonances of this book and its theory within academic study and in everyday life? Does the book's popularity tell us anything about the book's influence on religion, psychology, and science? Did the book alter the object of knowledge in religion and or in psychology? Does critical reflection suggest new ways to think about the religion, science, and psychology relation that moves beyond applying psychological models to religious experience or using religious or spiritual experience to secure psychological concepts or evidence? Today's symposium explores these questions in depth. Four scholars will lead us in our deliberations. The discussion will begin with a brief talk by by Professor Beyer on the history of the book's nearly 60 years. Professor Beyer is in the department of, or in the program of of women's studies at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York, where she teaches courses on notions of human nature in histories of women's psyche, imagining peace and debates among psychology, science, religion, and spirituality. Most recently, she has published essays on spirituality in 2014 and enchantment in an age of Occupy in 2012. She is preparing a chapter for a book of international scholars addressing the question posed of the 1970s as a time like no other when, quote, man became a mystery to himself. Well, a senior fellow at the Martin Marty Center, she is writing her book happily on revelation or revolution and cognitive dissonance and persistent longing in an age psychological a history and rethinking of when prophecy fails, the very book we will be discussing this afternoon. Joining joining Professor Bayer to offer further reflection on their own use of this book in their teaching and research is Lowell Bloss, pictured on the screen here, Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies and of Asian Languages and Cultures at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Professor Bloss taught a course at Hobart and William Smith titled New Heavens and New New Earths off and on for about 30 years or so for which he used the book When Prophecy Fails a number of times. 
Professor Bloss has published on Buddha and Naga and female renunciates of Sri Lanka. Susan Hanking, president of Shimer College, seated here to my right, um, uh, of, of Shimer College here in Chicago, joins Lowell as a respondent. President Hanking received her doctorate from the University of Chicago Divinity School in the Religion and Psychological Studies program in 1988. Her dissertation work on secularization used the book When Prophecy Fails. Professor Hanking, who, uh, who taught at the, in the Religious Studies Department at Hobart and William Smith before going to Shimer, has co-edited two books titled respectively Morning Religion and Querying Religion, or Querying Religion. She has written extensively in a variety of forums on religion and social sciences, American culture and religion, and on higher education. Finally, Seth Peter Patterson, and is Seth here? Yes. Oh, there you are, okay. Uh, Seth Patterson, our third panelist, is a third year MDiv student at the University of Chicago Divinity School. Previously, he had been a professional theater artist working mostly in Minneapolis. He has an MFA in theater performance in Florida Atlantic University, or from Florida Atlantic University. The working title for Mr. Patterson's master thesis is Dismantling White Supremacy. We can all, or can we all be prophets, or we can all be prophets? Question mark. <laughs> They're both valid at this point. Okay. <laughs> So please join me now in warmly welcoming Professor Beyer and our three panelists. Actually, I'd like to uh, welcome Seth, who will begin this uh, forum on When Prophecy Fails with a dramatic reading. An introduction. September 24th, 1954, Minneapolis Star. Head for the ark, folks. Word from space says floods do. <laughs> Chicago will be destroyed by a flood from Lake Michigan just before dawn, December 21st, according to a suburban housewife. Mrs. Dorothy Martin of Oak Park, Illinois, says this prophecy is not her own. It is the purport of one of many messages she has received by means of automatic writing. In automatic writing, a pencil is held in the hand and writes apparently without conscious direction. The messages, according to Mrs. Martin, are sent to her by superior beings from a planet called Clarion. These beings have been visiting the Earth, she says, in what we call flying saucers. During their visit, she says, they have observed fault lines in the Earth's crust that foretoken the deluge. Mrs. Martin reports she was told the flood will spread from the Arctic Circle to the Gulf of Mexico, from the west coast of Seattle, Washington, to Chile in South America. Mrs. Martin, a small, intense woman with black hair worn in a bun, admits she has encountered skepticism. <laughs> Her experiences began, she says, last Easter Sunday. She was lying in bed on the sun porch of her home when she felt an urge to write. My arm felt warm and I just put a pencil to the paper and wrote, she said. These are the words she found and her hand stopped writing. I am always with you. The cares of the day cannot touch you. We will teach them that seek and are ready to follow the light. I will take care of the details, be patient and learn, for we are there preparing the work for you as our connoiter. The meaning of this word was not explained. This is an earthly liaison duty before I come. That will be soon, I will come again to each of you. They that have told you they do not believe shall see us when the time is right. Now is the time to cast out for my little fishes. Go and get my children from the North Lake, and I will go with you. Mrs. Martin said it was signed, Elder Brother. <laughs> Chicago Daily Tribune, December 17th, 1954. Doctor warns of disasters in World Tuesday, worse to come in 1955, he declares. The world won't end Tuesday, but it is in for a pretty bad shaking up, Dr. Charles Lawhead, 44, former staff physician at the Michigan State College Hospital in East Lansing, said yesterday. He says the Earth's last cycle will come in 1955. There will be much loss of life, 
practically all of it in 1955, he said. It is an actual fact that the world is in a mess, but the supreme being is going to clean house by sinking all of the land masses we know and raising the land masses now under the sea. There will be a washing of the world with water. Some will be saved by being taken off the earth in spacecraft because the earth is the laboratory of the universe. Chicago Daily Tribune, December 22nd, 1954. The worldwide disaster that had been forecast for yesterday by Dr. Charles Lawhead and Mrs. Dorothy Martin was averted <laughs> or delayed by, quote, intervention on the part of the God of Earth. However, they said that yesterday's severe earthquake in the vicinity of Eureka, California, might have been part of the advance information on dire happenings they received last week, which included word of a cataclysm for the West Coast. Chicago Daily Tribune, December 24th, 1954. Sect de expects to depart this earth tonight. Mrs. Dorothy Martin, Dr. Charles Lawhead, and other associates have received word from the Space Brothers that they will be lifted up from the face of the earth tonight. Mrs. Martin said the group will gather in front of her home at 6 p.m. We have been instructed to sing carols while we wait to be lifted up, she said. Dr. Lawhead had gone back to Lansing Wednesday night to accept service on a summons in a suit which his sister filed to have him and his wife committed to a mental institution. <laughs> Thank you so much, Seth. The newspaper stories Seth uh, provided a dramatic reading from were those covering the span of four months, September to December of 1954, and the events surrounding the book that we're going to discuss today, When Prophecy Fails. I'd like to begin by um, thanking Lauren for introducing us and Seth for his dramatic reading and all of those who helped to put the arrangements together, Clark Gilpin, Taryn Wine, Julia Woods, and also uh, Bill Garashi, Emily Clues, and Emily who has been um, juggling all the technology here. I'd also like to thank the interlocutors joining us today, um, my colleagues for decades. Um, Prof um, Professor Emeritus Lowell Bloss and Susan Hanking, uh, colleague and partner. So, um, anyway, let me begin then to talk about chance encounters. Chance encounters of the kind that produce studies that then get discussed for many decades about who we are, what are our psyches made of, and how do we form beliefs about the future or how things will happen. And one of the reasons I wanted to have this uh, conversation today on the book is that as a historian of psychology, I've been very interested in how we approach classics. For many historians, they approach classics to kind of go behind the scenes, to dig out the secrets of how a study was done in psychology, or what really transpired behind those laboratory doors. Um, and the idea seems to be that if we can reveal those secrets, if we can get behind that, we might know something about the machinations that prompt us to think or to respond in one or another way. The most uh, popular one recently has been the debate around uh, Milgram's shock experiments, if you know them, and a history that's been done on those. But I really wanted to move away from the kind of historiography that it seems to me to be preoccupied with a debunking type of story, uh, a history that says that it can expose and reveal more or tell more secrets. I want to look at the whole sort of production of secrets and revelations um, as a way of thinking about a historiography. So hence the history of uh, what I'm calling an ethnography of encounters. As I said, Seth began his reading from the story that broke and turned Dorothy Martin, housewife, into a public figure in 1954, and that also 
Very quickly, the story left the Chicago area and was picked up in um, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, caught the attention of three social psychologists there, Leon Festinger, Stanley Schachter, and Henry Rieken. And so here we have this chance encounter, a woman's story of a prophecy and three social psychologists looking, casting about for some real life situation that they can study to get a handle on how our cognition works. So the way it transpired, if I give you a bit of a timeline, is that by October, Henry Rieken, Stanley Schachter, and um, Leon Festinger have contacted Dorothy Martin. And they fly from Minneapolis to Chicago, to Oak Park, to make acquaintance with her. And they were welcomed into her home at 707 uh, South Kyler Avenue. So they started then four months of undercover study. And as the study unfolded, as they started to put together who was in the home, they realized that there was another figure another colleague of Dorothy Martin's, Dr. Charles Lawhead, psychiatrist, and that his home was in East Lansing, and that they were going to now need to be in another location, Oak Park, East Lansing, and also their home base in Minneapolis. So they recruited and hired a number of graduate students from the University of Chicago and a number of graduate students from Michigan State University. So this little story of interest locally, turned in to a four-month undercover study that resulted in what we consider today a classic book of a one, two small groups, unlikely to meet up, but now together. One, a small group of believers waiting out their prophecy, and a second small group of social psychologists waiting out under disguise of being believers confirmation of their theory of cognitive dissonance. So how did the social psychologists imagine this encounter to be one about their Nasson theory of cognitive dissonance? Here's how they presented the dilemma in the first chapter of their book entitled Unfulfilled Prophecies and Disappointed Messiahs. And I quote from them. A man with a conviction is a hard man to change. Tell him you disagree and he turns away. Show him facts or figures and he questions your sources. Appeal to logic and he fails to see your point. Now they ponder this question further, asking readers to suppose what will happen if a man of conviction is presented with, quote, evidence, unequivocal and undeniable evidence that his belief is wrong. What, they ask, will happen? What they're posing here is the question that drives their story. But it's not one about thinking really and information. It's about that gut feeling that you have when you're confronted with something that runs counter to your beliefs. And that's what they're interested in. They're interested in how that visceral feeling of confrontation cries out to be resolved like a dissonant chord into one of con consonants. The formula seems rather overly simple, does it not? Each time I read this definition of cognitive dissonance, my art historian colleague Joanna Isaac's witticism regarding Magritte's hyperrealist image of a pipe with its precise, as she says, like a grade school teacher's handwritten note below, ceci n'est pas un pipe, this is not a pipe, springs to mind. Of this move, she cleverly writes, this gesture is too easy, like taking candy from a baby. So appears this 1950s concern with the persistence of belief in the face of evidence to the contrary. The gesture seems too easy, posed as if it is as, as it is as some mismatch between signs and reality, belief and evidence, some failure of correspondence but between belief and reality. Its assumption of a simple correspondence between a world of evidence and a world of belief seems almost, as my colleague says of Magritte, sentimental, longing for something else, another age, perhaps an imagined simpler one, perhaps one filled by harmony. For we must sense something more at stake or larger at work in this study of the persistence of belief. Why else would the book as the theory seem to enjoy so many afterlives? And let me just, uh, let's see. Um, there we go. So, okay, so this is the um, story. I'm trying to see this upside down. Um, this is Dorothy Martin. Um, with her many books filled with messages. And the uh, 
Chicago Daily News story, Clarion Call to City. Um, this is Charles Lawhead. And this is the two of them together. And um, this is the one that I wanted to bring up. All right. Um, there's an industry of research on prophecy, on groups waiting out prophecies, cults, and on the theory of cognitive dissonance that arose in the wake of believers' disappointment and of cultural expression. The story of this group and undercover social psychology has made its way into virtually every academic discipline since its publication, into everyday talk, into media on the study, fictional renditions, a BBC series based on the novel, or on one novel, through to heavy metal bands, one called When Prophecy Fails, and a second, Cognitive Dissonance. The concept has been turned about as a tool of protest, as you can see, made most famous by Adbusters. Adbusters was responsible for setting Occupy in motion. And it is a sign said culturally emblematic of our inner psyche and the status of American life. Its history has been written as a set of tweets, uh, as if contemporary life needed a condensed version, a brief reminder via digital media stream, no less, of our tendency to conflate belief with reality. This history begins with, quote, Seeker 7 reporting feeling excited for the end of the world, then immediately following this by second tweet, we've been saved by our unflagging faith, sent 57 years ago. And of course, Festinger's in the same Twitter feed, right, announcing his second book, A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance, published after When Prophecy Fails. This Twitter feed ends with psychologists dreaming up variations on one study, its neurological import, and Seeker 7 still rejoicing in saving the world, faith stronger than ever, sent one minute ago. From the outset, the book seems almost epic in scope, with its mix of prophecy, spaceships, psychology, and religion, all played out in the 1950s atomic age, with American culture turning its gaze at once to the skies beyond and to the atomic clock, housed in another Chicago neighborhood, Hyde Park, and registering two minutes to midnight in 1954. There was, in this moment, the question, however subterranean, of whether there would indeed be any future at all. There were its attendant questions of a fundamental shift change in the psyche, in our psyches, a different way in which we were oriented to time, in f to faith, and to commitment. As one writer put it, and I quote, salvation and apocalypse, sacred and profane, sex and death, the bomb contains them all as does the study narrated in When Prophecy Fails, captivating us with its story of this small band of believers as much as it does with its promise of revealing those secret interior dynamics of people finding themselves on edge, at odds with the world. The words secret and sacred, writes Mary Rufo, are siblings, and I quote her, our first experience of the world, she muses, is that the world is a secret, that it is, that is, it neither hides itself nor reveals itself. One of the earliest fictional renderings of When Prophecy Fails I know of is found in author Shirley Jackson's 1958 gothic science fiction novel, The Sundial. The title indicates the novel's interest in one early calculus of time set over and against another, the ages of what it means to be human. But a few pages in, and in case we miss the title's design on temporal and otherworldly concerns, Jackson prods at this symbolic conjunction of worlds by a sundial's arrival to the protagonist family's home, bearing its surprise inscription, quote, what is this world? This question, a quote from Chaucer's Tan Canterbury Tales, gesticulates toward when prophecy fails as a question of things beyond this earthly world, as a question of the human condition in a nuclear age, of how the unimaginable, sorry, the unimaginable may intrude into ordinary life. Jackson's Gothic story of two groups waiting out the end of the world, one in a Gothic cathedral of a home, and another, a group of ordinary townsfolk waiting out the end and their spaceship rapture outdoors in the commons. Jackson mimes worlds of difference, operating in when prophecy fails, and the chance occurrences that bring one world as it awaits world's end to be looking out the window at another group waiting as well. It was this idea of a world of difference that brought the researchers to Oak Park in the first place. Now, one of the things that I want to say to you, in addition to all the logistics involved, was that Festinger and uh, Rieken and Schachter were working on a grant together, funded by the Ford Foundation, and it was a large grant. And there were four institutions involved, the University of Chicago, the Committee on Social Thought here, 
the uh, Columbia University, its Bureau of Applied Research, Harvard University, its Sociology Department, and the University of um, Minneapolis or Minnesota, um, their um, laboratory for the study of social relations. And the thing was is that Festinger kept kicking around the idea to test his theory of cognitive dissonance that what he really wanted was some small millennial group. And um, he had this in mind. And it was really, um, as they were discussing this, that Henry Rieken and uh, Stanley Schachter go for coffee, and that's when they come across the story while they're out for coffee, and they take it back to the laboratory. And of course, Festinger's uh, very pleased that they have lit on this. So, but there were two other works that were shaping Festinger's thinking. One was a study of rumors in India related to the Indian earthquake of 1934 by psychologist Jamuna Prasad. What he theorized was that an event causing emotional disturbance has the power to be turned into a persisting sense of instability, which in its turn leaves a person and or group open to imaginative information from the popular mind seeking to fill in gaps of what is knowable. A second, and if not more than equally influential work on Festinger's thinking, was a 1924 book, Days of Delusion, a strange bit of history by Claire Endicott Sears a book of interest to those in the, quote, historical branch of social psychology. Considered in its day a case history of a prophet to which every, quote, student in psychology ought to be indebted to Sears. One reviewer viewed the book as detailing William Miller's obsession with his prof prophecy of World's End as, and I quote, one more excellent example of the way prophets, and then parenthetically, save those based on wide knowledge, deep wisdom, and keen reasoning are made. The book also exceeded a psychological case study in that it was regarded as making as significant contribution to the history of American life. Sears drew on others describing the broader psychology of this historical moment as a, quote, remarkable agitation of the mind. The year 1843, she writes, and I quote her, was also a year of great revival among the Shakers, all discovering mediumistic powers within themselves and continually conversing with those long dead and with prophets, martyrs, and scriptural characters. These two worlds, the one of rumors and the one of the Millerites, interweave with one another in their concern with communication, firmly held belief, the atmospherics of emotional qualia, and some human longing to, be f to fill out a story or account of things, or to know how will things go. When prophecy fails mirrors this narrative style, introducing first the theory of cognitive dissonance and its conditions, and then followed by a demonstration of the theory's value by calling on the historical record of what they deem failed prophecies. But there's another neighboring object having deep resonance in this subject, in this study, in Sears' history and the rumor study. The one concerned with madness, with irrational beliefs, with how these different religious beliefs and prophecies of world's ending speak to who we are, our anxieties and fears as humans. And it's that resonance, I must confess, the one with madness, the one that drove the story as far as I was concerned, um, that framed how I first regarded the book as a historian of psychology. For a good chunk of time, I didn't really entertain how prophecy was being lined up with madness. My focus was singular. It was on the issue of the disciplines, positioning of women, such as Dorothy Martin, as the other, the mad ones, the unstable ones, the overwrought ones, and so on, in psychology's efforts to secure the elusive parameters of the psyche's rational faculty. Thus, the question of Dorothy Martin loomed large for me as a historian of psychology interested in the longer history of women who served as psychology's subjects, that is, subjects of study who would never quite be seen as fully functioning humans by psychology's measures, but who were nonetheless central to setting the terms of what it meant to be fully human, a paradoxical state of affairs to be sure. I had not given much thought to the idea of prophecy itself or why social psychologists were actively discussing how a small millennial group would be their ideal object of study. It's an error of omission I prefer to attribute to a problem with my field rather than one to myself. <laughs> At the time, my thinking was that this instance of psychology's use of women's subjects was not simply one more piece of testimony in the long repetition of the discipline's practice historically. Rather, here once more, a woman played a significant role at a significant moment of a sea change in psychology's imagining of the human. 
no longer regarded as being pushed and pulled about by behavioral reinforcements, this book marks the discipline's turn from behaviorism toward cognition. In addition to the turn to cognition, mid-20th century psychologists were making an intervention, and I quote, into the fields of philosophical ethics and religion by way of therapeutic medicine. And neo-Freudians and other approaches began to shift the weight of analysis to a rational ego over the unconscious, downplaying the role of the superego as well, and signaling a fairly far-reaching revision to therapeutic religion. While not identical, and certainly not without controversy, one can see these turns as moving away from mechanistic or morally fraught notions of the human condition to ones where humans had within their reach the rational means to a moral and ethical life. What this suggests is that far from psychology and religion parting ways from one another or their division becoming deeper, their histories may be becoming instead entangled with one another in new ways through innovations in terms of how we envision the psyche and the methods by which we study the psyche within religious studies, whether therapeutic, historical, or social scientific. Here's one way to think about this tangle. Let's consider when prophecy fails fit alongside an additional case history. Now, there are many of these to which we could turn, but I'm going to turn to the one of the spirit mediums in the late 19th century. The ones who could, if they raised a protest, claim some founding status of American psychology for their part in creating debates in psychology, most notably, most notably that between William James and G. Stanley Hall featuring the famous spirit medium Mrs. Leonora Piper. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that debate, but it's a wonderful debate to read. And um, much has been published on that case, including a well-regarded piece by an historian of psychology some years ago who used this case to say that at that moment there was a good demarcation made through the study of Leonora Piper between sense and nonsense, between the rational and the irrational, or um, as G. Stanley Hall, through the many, many tests he performed on Leonora Piper to the point where her daughter called a stop to the tests, um, multiple selves. She had dissociation or multiple selves. But there's something else that we must recognize is equally important. New terms of the psyche emerge in that moment from studies where religion and or spiritual beliefs were not epiphenomenal to the study, but central a point clearly, carefully, and beautifully elaborated further by William James in his Varieties of Religious Experience, a work said to shift to your interior realms a sense of the religious or spiritual. New ways of understanding oneself, the psyche, conscious and unconscious life, emerge in James' work. The mystery of interior worlds was thrown further open as a mystery, and this throwing open proving instructive on the something more to who we are as human. Mid-50s America can be seen to serve as another marker in changes in how interior life was construed, this time absorbing more spheres of everyday life within the fold of cognition or rational choice, but now with less or perhaps different kinds of play given to mystery. When prophecy fails is key to this story for psychology and for religious studies. What did it mean to chart religious experience in cognitive terms, as though set out at this time? What did it mean to think of oneself as psychological through more narrowly construed cognitive terms, some of which were revealed through study of failed prophecy. Is there a way, I have wondered, and have struggled with in writing this history, to think about our encounters with a work, its travels, its phenomena within its knowledge, of how it functions and how it takes on, not just an account of an event, but an account of the world. At the risk of being seen as just part of some fashion trend, invoking the now well, although Marjorie Garber says it's so overly rehearsed, but then she uses it herself. Re Levi Strauss phrase, something good to think, and then he implied with. I will go ahead and ask, is when prophecy fails good to think with? That is, is there something more to be said about its curious twinning of hearing voices with hearing the word? Is there a field of demarcation functioning here that begs deeper analysis? Does this twinning of madness and prophecy, of hearing voices and hearing the word, function totemically in the history of psychology and perhaps in the history of the study of religion? The question of when prophecy fails assumes new proportion on thinking through its near synodical relation operating within, between madness and prophecy, and between psychology and religion in mid-20th century. As a historian, I've wondered about that relation 
And one of the ways I looked at it initially was to look at, well, who cited which work? When Prophecy Fails came out in 1956, A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance comes out a year later. And in tracking some of that with Kelsey Crick's help, one of the things that I've noticed was that psychology more often cites a theory of cognitive dissonance or the laboratory studies. Religious studies loves to cite when prophecy fails or when Festinger fails or when prophecy never fails. <laughs> and I wondered about that divide and I thought initially and wrote about it initially as a divide between epistemology and ontology and instancing that between the two disciplines. But this line of historical analysis suffers from some of the same ills noted earlier for a history of Dorothy Martin absent the tangle of religion and psychology. Psychology, religion, and science have a longer history for one. And for another, their relation seems to be more of how they tack back and forth between religious and psychological shores, each time changing the nature of their subject a bit and the nature of the concepts by which we understand ourselves as psychological or religious or both. It's not simply that concepts drift into the cultural ether or become popularized, but that their drift, much as James drew on meteorological metaphors to speak of mental atmospheres, unsettled and resettled ideas on how, as historian of medicine, Alicia Puglianesi puts it, and I quote her, sentiment can travel through the air, have waves of influence and operate sometimes in terms of energy like a storm around matters of belief and doubt faith and the future and the space of interior called the psyche. This seems a more interesting and historical question to me as it moves away from the idea of a history of relations amongst psychology, religion, and science that harbors within their relations some notion, even if metaphorical, about a fall or a narrative of redemption. To think about when prophecy fails as an ethnography of encounters then is to think about its more, quote, wayward, diffuse, redundant, and cumulative effects of engagements ones perhaps unknowable by reading its trace elements in literature and citations. <coughs> so, here are the questions it asks. Has, does pro when prophecy fails alter an object of knowledge in psychology or religious studies? Is it to invoke once more the question of whether when prophecy fails is good to think with? It is to inquire more broadly as uh, Janice Radway does in her criticisms of reception histories into how a book such as When Prophecy Fails enters into a larger dialogue, the one in which, quote, society talks to itself about its conditions of existence and thereby transforms it in the process. So with that, I want to turn to find the other angles on an ethnography of encounter. Um, first to Lowell Bloss, our colleague, Skyping in from Geneva, New York and then to uh, Susan Hanking, my Durkheimian interlocutor, as I think of her as well. Yeah, I'll do it this time. Get low. Am I up? Just about <coughs> low. With that one second, you actually look like okay. Dorothy Martin right now. So. <laughs> All right, let me move this away. OK. You're up. Okay, I'd like to thank Betty for uh, asking me to uh, help look at uh, this book. But I'm looking at the room now, and I'm I was thinking back to uh, listening to Georges Dumézil talking about five or six different languages, many of whom which I could not follow, and um, thinking back to Tillich speaking in this room. Um, I think this room, it, it, they all look as the same to me anyway, um, a long time ago when I was at the University of Chicago. And I thank uh, Betty for asking me to, to do this. Um, after leaving the University of Chicago, I went straight to Hobart and William Smith Colleges where I stayed. And I developed an advanced course uh, audaciously called uh, Sacred Space. I remember Iliani's uh, head snapping back when I told him what I was doing, and I don't know if that was bad or good uh, a comment. Um, but of course, in that course, I explored ways various peoples found the sacred in, through their travels or through their pilgrimages and in their temples. And, and at the same time, there was an element, of course, of the sacred time there the every when of the Australian Aborigines, um, 
the recreation uh, at, the te- at, at the temple rituals, etc. So I thought I should complement this sacred space course with a course um, on time. And that's where I developed this course on millenarianism. Um, I entitled it with a nod to Burridge, New Heavens and New Earth. And I'd just like to start with sort of a cleaned up version of a paragraph from Burridge about um, millenarianism. To dream a dream and make it come true. To realize the shape of what can be seen only in the mind's eye. To feel compelled to bring about the seemingly impossible. These are the prerogatives of humans. James Naylor was plowing his fields when in a blinding and timeless moment, he knew why he had been born. Like St. Paul, who never wavered in his adherence to the truth, revealed to him in a vision, James Naylor, despite the cruelties of parliament and the bigoted religious orthodoxy, remained steadfast in what his vision had revealed to him. Driven by her voices, a French peasant girl put new life into a dispirited army and routed the alien invader. She was burned at the stake as a heretic and a witch. She was also canonized as Saint Joan. Anne Lee claimed to be the new Christ. Joseph Smith had a vision of heavenly bliss to be revealed in an earthly community life. And thousands of miles and moments away, a Maori, a Papuan, an African, a Native American, each is impelled, was impelled, to tell the good news of a new way of life. Whether it's fool, fraud, saint, farmer, or tycoon, the pain of the millennium belongs only to us humans. It is why we are human, why when the time comes, we have to make a new human. In all these cases, the revelation that arises is beyond what was thought to be humanly possible. It transcends one's capabilities and introduces a new power to create this new human being. Now, many millennial movements arise in extreme conditions with multiple disasters in which the norms are questions, such as the ghost dance or the cargo cult. But there seems to be no condition which renders millenarian activities unnecessary. The issue is, after all, the establishment of a new humanity, a tapping of a transformative power, and a participating in that power. We have all had our bad times of unsettled, unsatisfied, confused, unsureness. We we do what, why we are doing what we are doing We all crave fulfillment, a life of worth and dignity, and self-respect. As Catherine Wessinger says, millenarian activities are an expression of the human hope for permanent well-being. We crave that. Mrs. Keach and her group have been tapping an extraordinary power. Saved by an impressive message of hope and salvation. They are the vanguards of a new human, a new humanity. And at these times, time becomes dramatic. There is a need to find the cipher for every second to find the correct interpretation. Yes, there are doubts, and it is hard work. It's upsetting work to Mrs. Keach and to others. It's hard to find the clues as to why that telephone call was missed, or who was that person who they met at the airport. (laughs) But there is a strange joy in persevering. Life is a search, a special journey. 
and no longer drab. It is full of meaning, and it is life on the edge of something great. And that's what I see as part of what is going on in um, this book. That's uh, why I used it a number of times. The possibility of deciphering each moment of life and making it great is uh, something that is transformative in itself. Whether the end point is reached, it never is going to be reached because you're going to interpret that end point and find another one. So I just suggest this as a series of thoughts about this book and I turn it back to Betty, and I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Susan. Uh, I have not become Shimerian enough to sit down while having thoughts. <laughs> um, so I want to say first how terrific it is to be here in Swift Hall, which in different ways than Lowell I think about it, and it with a certain nod to history. I'm particularly grateful to Betty for taking a risk on somebody who's uh, who has been an intellectual interlocutor for a long time, but relatively rarely in public. Um, I'm really grateful to her because I think she's brought something that I love um, back to the Divinity School in an in, in a, in a echo of the field I came from, religion and psychological studies, uh, and thus my beloved uh, Peter Holmes. You know, and I look at this, and she brought home to it. Now, what I just did is the opposite of what everybody in this room did. You laughed at the flying saucer. So I, that was not where I was going to start, but I want to point it out and connect it to a quotation I also uh, elided from my comments. A man named John Frum uttered a few sentences that are very important. He was a person in a cargo cult. And what he said to a, a, an individual missionary was the following. Why do you exactly find it bizarre that I've waited for 19 years for John Frum and you've waited and you've waited 2,000 years for Jesus? Why is it weird, a flying saucer, but we don't think angels in heaven are all that peculiar? So that's, I want you to think about the, our laughter and that in the background of what I'm going to say. So uh, a number of decades ago, I wrote a piece in the Journal of the American Academy of Religion with the title, The Personal is the Theological. In it, I focus on the ways in which theological discourse could, must be understood within the context of lives. It's inseparable from lives. In challenging the notion that such work stands separate from life, and I'm going to keep uttering that, I offered an, an approach that I'm going to take up today, but tweak. Uh, I'm going to make the argument that the personal or the autobiogra autobiographical is in some sense academic, and not merely in theology, but also in what I think of as the proudly non-theological field of religious studies, also known as I'm about to be profoundly narcissistic. I'm going to look not at the context of the text or the context of uh, the author, but the context of the reader. That would be me. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is travel down two t tracks hoping that these are offering more than some insight into my own personal uh, journey, but into uh, the, the book itself and its impact on the field of religious studies. And I'm going to start with the first track that I'm going to call Memory Lane. And as I do so, I'm going to invert the future orientation of a prophecy uh, in, a, in, a kind of, uh, in a kind of way, genuflecting a little bit towards the notion of historiography. So when Betty first suggested that I um, join this discussion, I was absolutely positive that I knew exactly when and where I encountered the book, When Prophecy Fails for the First Time. I had taken courses in the 1970s with a guy named Harry Parton, who was a Chicago-trained scholar of Islam that taught at my undergraduate alma mater. Parton taught a comparative religious studies course that included attention to cargo cults a form of religion which I thought was the bee's knees. I became entranced with them, and in fact, that's why I ended up in Swift Hall. Um, I, in fact, assumed, I believed, I absolutely knew that I first encountered Fessinger at all in that context. 
then I made a terrible mistake of engaging in some historical investigation, discovering a file folder that I had not yet tossed to, labeled Millennial Movements that contained my papers for that course, um, as well as the first sociology course I took with a guy named uh, Edward Tiriakin, who's a uh, well-known Durkheimian scholar who was a last no longer with us, and for another course on revival movements on Christianity. All these papers were written in the halcyon days of the mid-1970s, and none of them did I even mention when <laughs> prophecy fails. I might or might not have encountered the book then, but I certainly didn't cite it. So uh, as I realized this, I felt sort of cheated. I felt cheated of a part of the past that I believed existed. I felt sort of stupid for rewriting that past. I've been narrating this Betty for at least 20 years. <laughs> I felt that I might once have, I felt what I might once have naively labeled cognitive dissonance. I refused to give up. <laughs> Bad memory to the side, I was certain that there had to be some evidence of this encounter. <laughs> so I looked elsewhere to my undergraduate honors thesis entitled I, I, there was a certain turgidness even then. Melanesian cargo cult activity, some considerations. I knew to put a colon in, but I didn't know how to do the subtitles yet. <laughs> Lo and behold, there it was in the bibliography, and eventually I discovered it in Endnote 23 to Chapter 4, Theoretical Frameworks to Processual Models. <coughs> Based on a summary of when prophecy fails, here's what I argued. In regard to cargo cultism, the relevance of all this is obvious. The nature of cargo ideology guarantees the failure of the prophecy. A number of quite variable reactions to this failure have been cited. By the way, the, um, my honors advisor, a man named Charles Long, wrote next to that, really, Susan, how can you be so sure? <laughs> the failure here, I went on as follows. The failure of prior cults then creates an input into further development, which must be considered. A model delineating the emergence of the crisis situation containing within a notion of a feedback system, including the notion of dissonance, is then relevant to the consideration of cargo activity as collective behavior. This sort of model, based in general theories, provides some insight into cargo phenomena as collective problem-solving devices and clearly parallels the rational models noted to the above. Turgidness to the contrary, yeah. right? Um, there is evidence here that I thought when prophecy fails was not only important, um, to, to understanding cargo, but if you uh, take me as seriously as I apparently took myself then, to the understanding of everything there was to know about religion. I even included the word dissonance as a, with a little arrow in a feedback <laughs> diagram I provided in the honors thesis in appendix uh, 2B. <laughs> um, now, and I went on to argue that this revealed quite clearly that, there was, that the religious secular dichotomy was irrelevant and specious. Uh, that in fact the theories you used to explain religion were identical to the theories you used to explain any other form of cultural problem solving behavior, whether you were worshiping uh, Clark Gable, which was my favorite cargo cult in Africa, or waiting for John Frum to return. Possibly the most interesting part for me that I really did not recognize at all was a section in which I argued that when prophecy fails, and these people uh, in Papua New Guinea, in my case, uh, helped us to look at hope and sorrow, as well as our needs and our attempts to meet them as humans. Lowell and I did not prepare this ahead of time, nor did Betty and I. Most crucially for me, when prophecy fails, gave me a way to think about discomfort. So an encounter indeed. Now, I was, of course, not satisfied because I was trained at the University of Chicago and you need more evidence. So I will spare you my great effort to find every uh, syllabus ever taught in religion and psychological studies, no longer in the files, um, or letters from Peter Hermans. I do have one in which he does mention when prophecy fails to me to point out to me that there were other books I might think were important. Uh, instead, I'll turn to the equally turgidly titled American Protestantism and the Rise of American Sociology, a contextual study of varieties of secularization. Now, here again, I was utterly wrong. I believed firmly that by this time I had matured and was no longer considering only when prophecy fails, but had arrived at a book called A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance. This is utterly false. It is not cited there, and I learned of the existence of this book from Betty several decades later. So in, this, in the dissertation, in fact, I quote from When Prophecy Fails, 
I will spare you the long quotation, but it boils down to definitions of consonants and dissonance. Uh, I then asserted that, in fact, consonants and dissonance should be used to understand responses to modernity and secularization insofar as these emerged from or exhibited multiple contradictory worldviews. I said, basically, dissonance, cognition, psychology, and more, we can do better, we're religious studies. Uh, I could continue down memory lane beyond these initial encounters into the land of teaching, both the very first sociology of religion graduate course I taught uh, that included a text I only found out from Betty, had anything to do with prophecy fails, Alice and Laurie's imaginary friends, and my early religion and psychology courses I taught also with Hobart and William Smith, in which I used when prophecy fails because I had by then learned that not all psychology is psychoanalytic. Um, I should note, by the way, that my beloved religion and psychological studies was also the place to do sociology of knowledge here at the time, but I missed certain aspects of the historical reality. <coughs> um, now, so there's memory lane as one track. Let me go down a slightly different track, particularly since it turned out nostalgia and certainty memory and lived experience turn out to be inaccurate. So I, uh, my second trail has to do with something both Betty and by implication Lowell has raised, and that's the role of classics or canonical texts, since I'm in Swift Hall, in fields of inquiry in the academy. I once uh, taught a course that spent the entire semester on my favorite canonical text, The Elementary Forms of the Religious Life, and we spent a lot of time thinking about what, in fact, was a classic, uh, and whether or not, um, and what I'm going to at least imply here is that my own personal or individual encounter with a particular classic might offer us something to, or I genuflect not to Levi Strauss, but to Bayer, think with. Now, when I took up the topic of classics in my course on Durkheim, which I first read in college and I last read last week, I thought a classic was something you reread that was worth rereading, that had impact that broadened over time rather than faded, something that was discipline defining in one or more areas of intellectual life. I definitely didn't think it had to be right, since every single word uttered by Durkheim about Australian aboriginals is wrong in the elementary forms, even though the book is completely right in the only defensible theory ever, my view. Perhaps a classic is provocative, or in some sense stands for an approach to the world, perhaps, and again, uh, to genuflect to Betty, it's, it's totemic in our own self-definition. But um, I was pretty convinced I knew what a classic was. Uh, this you know, it seems somehow potentially important. Now, having said that, I do know that there are classics in many fields that sit around unread, gathering dust, in libraries or elsewhere, and other fields define themselves by the ongoing praxis of rereading. So I am going to talk a little bit and then close about when prophecy fails as a classic. So let me say first, um, I have not reread, unlike Durkheim, when Prophecy Fails every year since I first encountered it. At Durkheim, I do reread almost that frequently. But I think this issue about classics that can function sometimes in unexpected ways in provoking and shaping our thinking is important. The notion that classics stay alive is one way to put it, that they continue to teach, that they are or might serve as both personal and professional axis mundi to Jane Fleck in Eliade's direction, that they may in fact serve as personal classics in addition to or instead of functioning as discipline or interdisciplinary defining uh, texts. I think this is going to illumine a little bit about religious studies and RPS without necessarily washing all my laundry in public. So I'm going to admit it. When Prophecy Fails feels incredibly important to me, to both of the disciplines to which I owe my own allegiance and to me, it's not because I really care very much about cargo cults anymore, anymore or any failed prophecies, even the one that I associate with the word Christianity. No longer because I feel obliged to move beyond the psychoanalytic when I teach a course on psychologies of religion and everyone knows when prophecy fails is a classic and that's not just because I no longer teach. When prophecy fails shapes my thinking and I believe its impact on me still, almost every day. The book's impact was not because I understood or cared about the methodology of participant observation and the ethics of deception. In fact, I didn't really get it that it was de deceptive until it was pointed out to me that there was no person named Mrs. Keach. Her name was really Dorothy Martin. 
nor was it any particular attachment to the book itself or to cognitive dissonance that I think in some ways like ego or it or working through have become free-floating concepts untethered from their origins. Instead, here are a few considerations. When prophecy fails like other texts I encountered in the 70s and 80s, intersected with my discovery of the value of comparison in thinking through religion and to be Freudian working through my own background, which included, among other things, for those of you who care about religion, premillennial dispensationalism of a certain 1970s version. So for me, the idea that you might juxtapose flying saucers, uh, the Millerites, uh, John Frum, and some others was particularly useful especially in the context of my college experience and graduate school experience. In college, I thought that I had really just been radically amazing when I decided to, to write my paper on Charles Manson as the equivalent of a religion. Still hold the view, by the way, that meets the definition. Uh, so for me, the origins of comparison, the notion of comparison, of lining things up next to each other, around sameness and difference was fundamentally transformative and that opening parts of when prophecy fails were part of teaching me that. For me, Marion Keach, who I, as I said, have come to know as Dorothy Morton, seems not so different to me from members of some little oddball group called the Jesus Cult wandering around what's now disputed territory in the Middle East or cargo cults in Melanesia. Right? The Oak Park group seemed both familiar and radically unfamiliar to me and was useful to think with. Uh, now, a second thing. Um, I also read the work when prophecy fails, or at least in this narrative, which I'm making up since I have no written evidence of anything, through the lens of disappointment, identifying with members of the group. I also read it through the lens of a desperate need for rationality, identifying with the social scientists, and through the lens of someone who knew the pressures of small groups to believe even when it seemed unwise. Some of those small groups, by the way, occurring in Swift Hall. Uh, today, as I think about this, I know that I was um, interested in what the relationship was between rationality and emotion, for example. I was raising those questions that are certainly defining of the field of religious studies in the time period. Rationality and irrationality, close and distant, value-laden, value-free, groups and individuals, aloneness and togetherness. So in some ways, in, uh, when prophecy fails, I would argue, our hidden or perhaps even closeted emotions are connected to how classics shape us like when prophecy fails. Lest we be fooled, it's worth noting that just like our laughter, dissonance as articulated in when prophecy fails is not merely cognitive, nor is it a solitary experience. Uh, I should say, um, as, as one thing I also missed, because sometimes the things we miss are as important, it never crossed my mind, really, um, until very recently, that Dorothy Martin was a woman. Uh, and so I did not attach it to my own teaching, including the work of Susan Serrett, or I am Lewis, or Karen McCarthy Brown, or Elaine Wallace, in terms of the role of women and their importance in gaining uh, authority within certain contexts through the lens of uh, what apparently other people think is crazy. Now, I have two final points. One has to do with my penchant for what I think of as dialogical fields, uh, also known as religion and psychological studies, which from now until eternity I will repeat every time I'm in Swift Hall. Uh, I, I miss my opportunity to tweak uh, Clark, who I once accused of murdering my, my family by killing off religion and psychological studies when he was dean here. Uh, I'll tweak him the next time I see him. But um, one of the failures of dialogical fields sometimes is the uh, taking, both the failure and the richness, is the taking of theoretical frameworks from elsewhere and applying them in the study of religion. The risk is that it can be a cookie cutter. Now, I happen to be someone who really, really likes cookies, but if you attest to this, I think cookies, not the ones online, but cookies in general are really great, but we all know that if you eat too many of them, you can become ill. In my case, right, if you listened to those turgid words, when prophecy fails was deployed in a cookie-cutter fashion. It was deplo deployed without a significant reflexivity about its theoretical standing in its field of origin, but also in its use in religious studies. Now, the last thing I have to say um, makes me think that it was worthwhile spending all those years across the hall from Lowell. As I 
really looked back at my own encounter with this, and as I've listened to Lowell and I've listened to Betty talk about it, memory lane and these reflections on classics lead me to another conclusion that I think is probably incredibly important for us all. Dorothy Morton, as the others who appear in her work and in Fessinger at Hall's work, and are hidden behind it, were human. So were those annoying scientists. They were human. They were imperfect. They were frail. They did not merit some of, perhaps even, our laughter. They certainly didn't merit some of my attitudes towards them, nor perhaps do those oddballs who were wandering around the Middle East. The point I'm making here is that um, in all of our cases, right, the value of this piece is to remind us of some of the points that Lowell made, that um, we ought, and, and applying them to ourselves, that we ought not construe ourselves as failing when rationality fails us. Conversation. I'd love to know if some of the, how many of you have read the book when prophecy fails. So I'd love to hear about your encounters or to weigh in or ask questions. Don't be shy. Oh, wait, I'd like to know when you first read it. Oh, sorry. I read it um, at Radcliffe. Um, when I was very young, I read it with Arthur Darby Knock who was teaching some crazy courses on conversion. Um, one of the only courses I took in religion. Um, and it made a tremendous impression on me. Um, I think I got something very different from it, from what um, the rest of you are, are getting from it. Because I was beginning to study India at that time, too. And coming from a really relentless enlightenment background, what I loved about the people, were the stories that at first I thought were uniquely insane. You know, the crazy stuff that the Hindus believe. And when prophecy failed made me respect a part of, again, to be human, which had no, which didn't care about whether it was really real, whether it was really going to happen. Um, just the emotional importance of believing in something that you hung on to, even when it was obvious to you, too, that it wasn't true. And um, it made me realize how basic that was to the human condition, so that when I thought, do the Hindus really believe that God is, is, has snakes holding up his trousers? I mean, is this something weird that, you know, Hindus don't have? Well, everybody believes weird things. Um, so it, for me, it, it justified... Um, it, it made me respect more the more outlandish flights of imagination um, in Hinduism. It made me realize that rational belief had really nothing to do with it whatsoever, that it was about something else. So that was very valuable to me, and very surprising, too. Because when I was like, oh, these stupid people, the earth didn't end, uh, why would they go on saying it's going to end? Didn't they? So I, I, it made me a little less flat-footed about religious faith, and therefore a little more respectful of, of the assertion of belief in something which could be actively disproven. So it made a, a big, um, it made a big difference to me. I saw my fantastic stories in a different light, um, mm -hmm. and I thought it was a wonderful book. Mm -hmm. um, I read it also with a, a Jerome Bruner. Oh, in history of science, mm -hmm. and also a man named Leonard Nash, and I became, I was a section man, as we called it in those days, in that side three, and Prophecy Failed was something we read with another icon of the period, which is um, uh, Thomas Kuhn's mm -hmm. uh, work mm -hmm. on the scientific, uh, the scientific revolutions, which made, which I thought made another paradigm shift, right? That was another phrase you had, like mm -hmm. cognitive dissonance, which to me gave some of the same lesson. Namely, you don't believe that the sun goes around the earth because there's scientific evidence for it. You believe it because you come to believe it, whereas you used to believe that the earth went around. You, you, you believe things for reasons other than, and in the face of, massive scientific evidence to the contrary. <coughs> I mean, they believe in the Earth-centered universe, the, the 
The astronomical evidence was mounting up for centuries, just like proof that the world didn't end. So I saw those two books together um, uh, as, as pointing a very, I don't know what the timing is, I think the timing is very similar. a little bit against the theories of primitive that have prevailed in anthropology, so sort of they know things in a more basic way than we civilized people know and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to wipe out that kind of dichotomy. Mm -hmm. um, and the critique of the supposed superiority of another thing was going on at that time, the distinction between science and magic was being erased. Mm -hmm. We have science, they have magic. So you have these books showing that magic is really a form of science, and science is a form of magic, as everyone wants. So again, this sort of re-evaluation, of, of kind of a racing of the, of the enlightenment dichotomy between the way we think and the way women think, children think, people of color think, and so forth. Um, the, the, the erasing that kind of um, superiority, enlightenment, um, male superiority. Patriarchal shit. Yeah, that's kind of where I started. Sort of going back and that's like, yeah, with that sort of stuff. With other people who read or encountered it. I came across it in, uh, here. In the first course I ever took with um, Martin Reese Brod and Bruce Lincoln. And I was fishing around for a paper. I was, I remember walking up to Bruce and <coughs> fishing for something, and he said, you, "He said you're fishing, right?" So he um, he said, "Why don't you uh, have a look at uh, Fessinger's book on um, prophecy tales?" I had never heard of it before. I was coming from theological studies at a seminary uh, in the school, and sort of found my way eventually into the sociology of religion, um, more in the Bayerian mode than the Durkheimian mode. We can talk about what's true and what's not. So, um, the, uh, but I, I remember reading it, and, and you know what you had to say, um, Susan, about 
comparison and um, you know discovering when prophecy fails as a as a useful book to think with. Um, it was part of my discovery of comparison, and I ended up using the book in a paper that I wrote for the seminar on Anabaptism and Bavi um, Bahaism, Bavi movement in Iran. Um, the Anabaptists and Munster and, and the Bahai or the Bavis in Iran failed spectacularly, went down in a blaze of violence, and found myself thinking about what happens in the aftermath. Of that, um, and talked about how pacifism in both of these groups, so the Baptists become the Baha'is and the Anabaptists become the Mennonites and other groups uh, that reject violence, um, whereas in their origins, you know, were quite violent groups or had to contend with violence imposed against them. Um, and whereas I think when prophecy fails, talks about it does talk about this. How do groups cope with, you know, with with the failure, the supposed failure of prophecy, and the various mechanisms that are then that, that come to play with that? Um, and I found myself thinking about this in more political terms. But as I was listening to Lowell uh, and to Susan as well, I got, I got to thinking about mourning and sorrow in the aftermath of failures, of seeming failures, and um, you know how then groups will remember their martyrs. Um, and, and narrate uh, the events of failure uh, in, the, in, the, in the decades and, and centuries that follow in the continued course of development of their, of their movements. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah? Can I jump into that? Because when you talk about mourning also, I was thinking that it's interesting that no one has spoken of denial mm -hmm. as a concept which also took off from Western yeah. Europe That's mm -hmm. and became a more useful psychological term why it is that people simply ignore the facts, in particular, but not only, after grieving, right? Yeah. The stage you go through um, as a valid uh, in, in variable thing, and you can say that they were in denial, they were grieving uh, the, the loss of the community, the threat to the community, mm -hmm. something like that. So I think that's also part mm -hmm. of it. And it's another thing which became more respectable in psychological mm -hmm. circles under the, and also more popular under the term denial, mm -hmm. um, rather than irrationality yeah. or mm -hmm. all those other words. So mm -hmm. they, they get out a new kind of um, mystique. Um, and it's still an operative um, term in, in psychological analysis today. I think it is with mourning than that. I think the denial part also um, became very close to the idea of self-deception, which became very important during the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. once more in psychology. So um, the idea that um, you know you have false thinking or you're deceiving yourself mm -hmm. uh, or you're refusing to look or whatever. So denial is important, um, but it also kind of just sat right beside another concept, mm -hmm. and that was a concept <coughs> that um, was in a lot of the work actually in psychology, um, including with the uh, spiritualists. Um, it organized a lot of the study of them, and they organized their own demonstrations to show that they weren't being deceptive. And it, it has a very interesting history as a concept. So it sits beside the one of denial in um, when prophecy fails, and that psychology takes up a lot um, misattributions, um, the, all the kinds of errors people can make, and so on and so forth. What's interesting to me, though. Um, is also a question of, did the object of um, religious experience change with this? Um, did this book in some ways and cognition introduce something that not just in the um, paradigm shift or in the Foucauldian shift, but is there some way in which the, the, how we conceive of religious experience, the object of it, starts to become remade, uh, was transformed? That's, can I make a comment about that? And I have an oddball question for Lowell, if that's okay. Because um, I actually am inclined to think this. I think because in certain parts of the West, the focus is on belief, mm -hmm. not practice, that when prophecy fails actually just fit into the trend of ignoring what people actually did and looking at what they believe. Mm -hmm. And um, ignoring, and then trying to explain the relationship between I don't know the language of cognition as well, but beliefs. Um, use that explanation to make some sense of why people have faith. 
Um, and, and somehow it has to do, I think, with that. But, but I, I, another way of thinking about this is why I wanted to ask all something. I wonder if the book was read, was read differently by generations of students mm -hmm. around that same issue mm -hmm. of whether or not the notion of what counts as religion or how people think about religion or the group that's reading it might sh shape different answers to your question based on the reader. Yeah, I agree. Um, Long? Wow. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to say something very general, I guess, to begin with. Um, when I started to teach, um, we had many students who were giving up or questioning their traditions. So they actually had traditions, um, particularly, particularly the Catholic students were most intrigued by religious studies. They seemed to be involved in, in that questioning that maybe started just before they got to college. So at first there was those who were essentially questioning and maybe searching for, for some answers, you know, that the old traditions didn't give them. I, I don't know if that's true, but I, I think that is. As in the next 10 or 15 years, you had students who had no sense in, or very little sense of a tradition. Um, and they, I don't know if they were, they were, they would, they would keep asking me, what do I believe? You know, instead of, um, it, it, and I would say, <laughs> I, uh, a lot of things. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, and I would send it back to them. Uh, where uh, do you think it is important to believe? Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly where I can go with this, uh, uh, Susan. Um, there was certainly a shift. Now, if we look at that, and, I'm, and I, I'm not sure how that all worked with uh, when prophecy failed. Uh, um, I would expect that the very first students would have looked at this and said, well, that's what religion's like. You know, that sort of, it's that mystical thing that, 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 that uh, we're having trouble with that belief anyway. And, why, and, then, and it's the same, same thing with their parents. Why are they believing this? Um, or with the priests or whatever. Um, later on, um, I think it would, I would expect that the students would have been looking at this, at this pretty much equally to everything else. Uh, it, 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 there was sort of, sort of a relativity in the air, right? Um, and maybe they were, this was just another belief. You know, uh, I, I don't know, it, it, I'd like to hear your response to that. You've taught some of these students. Does that sound about right? Well, the, the frightening part I'll say is that the first thing is I was, you know, I'm of the generation that you described for, at first, right? So I'm in, in college in the 70s, at a time period when finding a reason to get out of a tradition was an important part of at least my experience of religious, uh, of my original encounter with religious studies. My experience of, of teaching it across, hmm, it, so I taught it first at an open admission state school in Illinois called, I, I taught imaginary trends, called Western Illinois University. And I actually, because I've been ruminating about this, I have been thinking about that course. It was a graduate level course in sociology of religion. But Western Illinois at the time was bifurcated two populations. African Americans from urban Chicago, very urban. And people from, white people, from towns that had maybe 250 people. And they'd never encountered each other before. And their reactions to everything in the sociology of religion course were very bifurcated. Um, and the, the uh, maybe this is a stereotype, but my memory is that the small town people were enraged by imaginary friends and by the idea that Jesus might have something to do with flying saucers. 
And the people from the city were much less, um, although also religious, were less traumatized by the idea of looking at things that might be seen as radically dissimilar next to each other. At, at Hobart and Smith, I, I think that they became more and more puzzling to students was less the beliefs and more what does it mean to belong to a group, which is the part that I think I've missed also early in my life. Mm -hmm. um, did, did it change in your teaching over time? Hmm. Well, it did because when I first taught it in the early 90s, students dug up more historical examples, War of the World, that would bring in you know, radio programs and so on and so forth, and sort of put it in that larger context of other historical cases um, about um, widespread beliefs or groups or that sort of thing. In later years, I think there was more of an emphasis, and that could have been my shaping for sure, um, on the sort of story, the, the narrative arc of the story is that you have a belief and um, it ends up that the sort of judgment at the end is that you're mad, you need to um, go under psychiatric observation. And we should bear in mind that Dorothy Martin was asked to leave the state and um, because she was told that um, she could, she had two choices, but they only spoke to her husband, according to the newspapers, and there's no um, archives of the police uh, station in Oak Park for it. I've requested archives, but they don't have any record of formally charging her, so there wouldn't be an archive. Charging um, her with what? Um, disturbing <clears throat> peace, influencing minors, and wow. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's how the newspaper story writes it up. And that um, her husband was told that uh, she either could be forced into psychiatric treatment, institutionalized, or she had to leave the state and seek help elsewhere. And so, you know, I think that is a focus that um, many... What did she do? She left. She left in the dark and high. <laughs> yeah. Where did she go? She goes to... Um, oh, Seth is going to do the epilogue. <laughs> but, um, she goes to uh, Arizona. She stays with a friend, actually, uh, nearby. And some of the people who worked with her in, in later years says, say that she recalls that moment as very chaotic and that someone came to her home and told her that for her own well-being she needed to leave quickly. Who knows really what the dynamics were there. It's impossible um, for reasons of memory and documentation and all of that. Um, but she goes from there to Arizona. She goes from Arizona to California, from California to South America for quite a number of years, comes back to California and sets up a place in Mount Shasta and where a lot of young people stay with her for a number of decades, and then she goes back to Arizona where she passed away. Did she read this with her? She still had a copy of the book on her bookshelf when she got it. Mm -hmm. Fessinger and I believe a photo of Blavatsky. That's <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful combination. <laughs> yeah. Unholy yeah. children. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, I know that people are having to leave, the time's getting on, so Seth is going to give us a bit of an epilogue to it, and uh, then there'll be time for reception and talk, I'm sure. So, thank you everyone very much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so and we'll have the epilogue to the story. A conclusion. Late in December, an unfriendly world finally forced the small band of believers into diaspora. <laughs> Trouble had been brewing for Mrs. Mark for quite a while, as we have seen her beliefs in populated planets and interstellar spaceship travel had a strong appeal for schoolboys, and all through the fall they flocked to her. As far back as October, their parents had lodged a complaint to the police who warned Mrs. Martin to cease and desist. This warning instilled in her a fear of police action that she had lost. Then on December 24th, the episode of the Christmas Eve caroling brought the indignation of Mrs. Martin's neighbors to a climax. The band of believers no longer shy gathered in front of the Martin home to make their final bid for salvation. As they caroled, and waited for a spaceman to visit, they were ringed about by a crowd of some 200 unruly spectators, and police were called to control the mob. 
That evening, the police were flooded with complaints against Mrs. Martin, ranging from disturbing the peace to contributing to the delinquency of violence. Christmas was a day of peace. But on the morning of December 26, a warrant was sworn out making specific charges against Mrs. Martin and Dr. Lawton. The group of believers were dispersed by forces outside their control, legal action, or some accident of personal situation. And while circumstances combined to pull the steadfast inheritance apart, the group failed to win a single new convert. They were unskillful proselytizers. It is interesting to speculate, however, on what they might have made of their opportunities had they been more effective apostles. For about a week, they were headline news throughout the nation. Their ideas were not without popular appeal, and they received hundreds of visitors, telephone calls, and letters from seriously interested citizens, as well as offers of money which they invariably refused. Events conspired to offer them a truly magnificent opportunity to grow in numbers. Had they been more effective, this confirmation might have portended the beginning and not the end. <laughs> Thank you. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.